now. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. I just want a, a few logistical things and a little bit about us. So uh, first, um, welcome and thank you for joining us in this Lunch and Learn. We have a handful of these every year and um, it's been interesting to, uh, to do them virtually, but I think it's been successful. So I'm glad that everybody could be here. Uh, we are the Great Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve, and uh, most of you, I see a lot of familiar uh, names, so most of you know who we are, uh, but there's a few names that I don't recognize, so just to give you a little bit of a background, we are part of a national network of reserves. There are 30 reserves in 23 states and one in Puerto Rico, and Great Bay uh, National Estuary and Research Reserve was established in 1989. We've got four core programs, education, research, land stewardship, in a coastal training program. And we are a partnership between the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and uh, New Hampshire Fish and Game. And we also get a lot of support from our nonprofit friends group, the Great Bay Stewards. And um, so this Lunch and Learn, uh, we're, it's gonna be a little bit different than some of the ones you may have been on in the past. We, uh, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and tap, type them in the chat box and I will help facilitate those questions. That way there's not too, too much going on. Uh, right now, everybody's video and sound are turned off, which will help us when we share the screen. And if, um, if you missed the first Lunch and Learn in May, that was our live Osprey Cam, you can see that on our YouTube channel. So you may wanna go back and watch that if you weren't able to uh, at, at that point. And I think, uh, I think that's it. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly Lachlan and she's gonna give us a little bit of background about the project and our guest speaker. All right, well, thank you, Melissa. Um, again, I'm Kelly Lachlan and welcome everybody to our second live Osprey uh, Zoom with ornithologist, Dr. Bob Kennedy. Um, Bob has published more than 50 scientific and popular articles on birds, including uh, the definitive a guide to the birds of the Philippines, including um, and he has held uh, academic positions around the nation at institutions such as Yale and Harvard, UMass, and many more. Um, Bob joined us at the Discovery Center a couple of years ago to assist us with our birds and our efforts uh, using our pair of Osprey. And so um, with that, I'd like to actually um, ask Kelsey Hansen, our naturalist, to go ahead and share her screen. Um, and uh, you'll see soon what the Osprey are seeing from their nest. And then I will turn it over to Bob. Bob, you can go ahead and Take it away and uh, Kelsey, I'll have you sort of zoom into the nest. Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you again for inviting me to be here, uh, Kelly and everybody. Um, we're looking, uh, last time I gave you an overview of ospreys in general. And if you have any questions uh, that I didn't answer then, or that if you weren't participating last time, if you'd like to ask questions, please feel free to do so. We're now looking at the female osprey um, on the nest and she is sun shading her um, 10 day old osprey chick at this point. You can see uh, that her wing, her left wing is spread out over the young protecting it from the sun and, and that's mm -hmm. a very important thing to, to do today because that chick would overheat and could perish in the kind of heat we have today if it was in the direct sun. Uh, if you uh, look behind them, uh, if we can zoom back out a little bit, you'll see that two of the eggs uh, did not hatch this year. Uh, now, uh, based on the hatching dates or based on the laying dates of the eggs, uh, it looks like our youngster here is the middle of the three eggs. The first egg apparently did not hatch and the third egg apparently did not hatch. Why they didn't hatch, um, that's really a big question. Um, normally the young will hatch, uh, you know, the eggs will hatch. And uh, if there's adequate food, all three will survive. But if there's not adequate food that the parents catch and bring into the nest, then they may lose this, the younger chick. And that's uh, one reason why uh, the young are 
and the female incubates from the first egg laid. Uh, so they hatch, they're, and they're, these eggs were laid at three day intervals. It's usually two day intervals, so that's unusual. Now the female is, uh, let's get back to her, see what she's doing. Okay, looks like she's trying to just adjust herself to provide the best shade for the chick. Um, okay, so these eggs were laid at three day intervals. Uh, normally it's two day intervals. Um, and the reason for that is that the eggs will then hatch in that same sequence at three days apart or two days apart. And the older young obviously gets food first. So it starts to grow uh, and is larger than the next one and, and the third one. And going back to what I was saying, the uh, food uh, is, a, is an issue. If it is an issue, then the younger one might not survive because the other male just arrived with a little bit of a uh, fish. Uh, he's a little bit smaller. You can actually see the comparison, even though there's probably a little different position here you can see that he is smaller than the female. Um, and also look at his white breast. Um, and when we have a chance to see the female, she has kind of a necklace of uh, brown spots on her breast. Uh, and these are distinctions between the two. Um, just looking at the birds now, you can see that the, uh, uh, the male on his right leg has a band and the female has a band on her leg and we caught both of these adults last year uh, and banded them on the same day so that we could keep track year after year of who is nesting on this, uh, you know, on the um, Discovery Center platform here. So where was I here? Okay, the chick, this is typical normal behavior for a young osprey, lots and lots of sleep, uh, maybe rousing every once in a while. Now the female, uh, she's gonna go over and try to get the, the food from the male right now. There you can see that she's banded on the left, on the right leg. Uh, and he will either transfer that to her or she's gonna walk over and grab it from him. So let's see what happens. But again, you can see this clear size difference between them and the necklace that the female has versus the male um, on the screen there. So let's see what they end up doing here. Uh, he just did a little, the youngster did a little stretch there. And uh, you can see the young bird is panting too. So it's, it's hot. So, okay, the transfer, food transfer has taken place. Notice that that's the back end of the fish, the tail. Uh, normally before the male arrives with food, he will eat the head and take care of his food needs before he brings food to the, to the nest. So this is great. We're, we're now gonna watch the female. Okay, she just took a piece of, her, of the, the prey for herself, but she just tore off a tiny little pea-sized piece and offered it to the young osprey. And that's about the size they feed the babies, just a very tiny little piece and she'll keep doing that. Uh, meanwhile, the male is adjusting nesting material there. He doesn't particularly like that piece of wood or maybe there's something underneath it that he's looking for, but he'll soon leave uh, as she feeds the young. Now, uh, okay, so he's very gingerly walking. You can notice uh, uh, as he's walking across, he's very, very careful on the nest that he's not stepping on the, the young or the eggs. And what he's doing with his bill there is he's actually cleaning it and wiping off any bits of fish that might remain on his bill. So this is a great family scene. We were so lucky to have this happen Why uh, everybody's watching today. But uh, if we were to, you know, in, in a bi if I was here as a biologist, I'd be counting the number of pieces of food that the, the female offers the chick. I'd be recording the behavior of the male and what he's doing. Uh, he's probably gonna fly off in a minute here and go, uh, roost nearby or I'll go out and catch another fish. Uh, but he is, he seems to be concerned about the nesting material. He says, oh, this stick isn't in the right place. I want to move it over here. Um, so uh, that's, that's what he's doing. Now he's in the way of our youngster. So Bob, we have our first question. Yep. Um, does the food transfer occur all of the time or does the male also feed the young directly? 
Um, if the female is, well, later on in the nesting cycle, both the male and female will go hunting for fish or go fishing. And um, so if the male brings the fish in, uh, when the female's not there, he will feed the young uh, in the nest. But at this age, <clears throat> almost all the feeding of the young is done by the female. And so there's a food transfer, and that was a very nice, easy transfer. Um, sometimes it can get kind of aggressive, particularly if it's been a long time since the male came in. The female might race over and grab it from them, and, uh, and then she might go into a spread wing um, uh, posture and start calling, uh, a behavior called mantling, where she's protecting the prey for, she's hiding it from the male and saying, get out of here, get out of here, you know. So, um, Anyways, you can see that she's taken a little couple of little bits for herself now. And the, ch the young is still, you know, oops, there is, she just took some for herself. Okay, another little bit for the, for the youngster there. Uh, and how often do the baby osprey eat? As frequently as the, the parents can bring food into the nest, just about. Um, so, you know, they could eat hourly and um, they will eat so much that they, the food goes into the upper part of the stomach called the crop. And if you look at the young right now, you can see a little bulge right below his neck, right? Uh, and uh, that is the food that is accumulating in his crop. You can see that bulge right there now above his uh, breast and uh, at the bottom of his neck. And that will get to be, you know, for this size osprey, about the size of a golf ball. And then he will move away like he is right now. He's not begging for food right now. He's panting. Uh, they don't have sweat glands or anything like that. So the only way they can cool themselves is by panting. Um, so he's looking around and saying, okay, I'm, I think I'm done. The mother recognizes that he's finished eating for the moment, he or she. We don't know the, uh, the sex of this bird at this point, um, but she's gonna finish off the rest of the prey there. And very soon the male will leave after he gets through tending to making sure the nest is the way he wants it. And as soon as he leaves, then she'll probably adjust it back to the way she wants it. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, um, it's very nice to know, you know, how old this bird is. Uh, I think I might have said nine days. It's actually ten days old today. So uh, uh, it's, you know, w whenever I go to another osprey nest and we haven't documented the exact uh, egg laying, I have to guesstimate uh, how old they are. Now the young osprey, as you can see from this guy, um, they have that white stripe down the back. And that will remain white um, during the uh, early stages of uh, their growth until they start getting the real feathers. Now they're down feathers uh, on, on the, you know, uh, birds covered with down feathers. And there are a couple of little contour feathers coming out on the head on this guy. But other than that, he's basically covered with down. And if you notice that white stripe, um, with the brown on either sides, look at the nesting material and you'll see a lot of, you know, vertical or horizontal patterns of white. And when he lays down in the nest and the parents give the signal that there's an intruder nearby, he will lay and play dead in the nest and he will look exactly like the nesting material. He'll blend right in at, into the nesting material. So, um, um, uh, I think this is a good example. Later on, I, they, as they get more feathers, I actually call them uh, uh, tar babies, uh, my nickname for young that are about uh, a little bit older than this until about 21 days old, because they look like they're covered with tar but with the new feathers coming in. And uh, that white stripe, I always call a racing stripe, you know, so he's got the racing stripe right now. So, uh, the question might be, uh, what, uh, what's going to happen to the two eggs that are in the nest right now? Um, 
normally those will be buried by nesting material and eventually will either, they could explode <laughs> uh, in the hot sun because as the eggs uh, uh, become addled or, uh, or rotten really, uh, they will start uh, producing gases that could cause the egg to crack and, and release the gas or they could explode. Um, which is a pretty nasty thing uh, if it happens when they're not buried. Um, but those eggs will eventually just become part of the nesting material. And, um, uh, and now if we, when we go out to actually band this youngster, uh, we might collect the eggs and use them in the educational programs at the Discovery Center. And if we do that, we would have to uh, empty the contents of the eggs um, before they could be um, put on display or put in a, a, an educational program. Now the little guys out there looking around and at the edge of the nest, um, and uh, looks like she's coming over to see if he wants any more. You can see he's not very aggressive in grabbing it right now. If he was really hungry, he would be right in her face begging for food. Um, so our outdoor, uh, yep. yep. Uh, we do have a question which you partially answered. You talked about how she shades him with her wings to protect yep. him from the hot heat. Will she also um, use her wings in that mantling position to protect him or her from predators? Um, like, no, but mainly the mantling is a shielding um, uh, of the food um, if a predator started to come, uh, she would start screaming. You know, she would raise not her normal osprey call, but she would start a higher pitched uh, call. And if a predator actually came within the uh, or too close to the nest, she might fly off and, and attack it directly and try to drive it away. Uh, if the male is nearby, he will join in that uh, uh, trying to drive the predator away. But she is the most more aggressive of the two usually. Um, <clears throat> she's bigger um, and um, when, you know, her size alone would drive perhaps a mammalian predator away uh, and attacking them. And uh, at times, uh, when we actually study ospreys and we climb into the nest, the female will, you know, some are very aggressive or, and some are not. Some will just fly around overhead screaming at us to get out of there. And, uh, and some will actually dive at us. And uh, at one point, as I was uh, coming over the edge of a nest to, uh, to see what the contents were, uh, a female actually hit my hat and knocked it off my head. Um, so uh, it's kind of scary when you have a, you know, two to three pound bird diving at you at 40, 50 miles an hour, uh, you know, a bird with a five foot wingspan, and then suddenly they drop those talons and uh, which are very large and very sharp. And you can get a, a, a haircut real quick by, uh, or even a scalping <laughs> if you're not careful. <laughs> Uh, so you sort of answered this already, but we had a, a handful of people that joined us a little late. Maybe you could list again some of the possible reasons that those two eggs are not viable. Yeah, the, um, yeah it's really hard to say without analyzing the eggs, um, but the, the first thing could be that for some reason they weren't fertilized. Um, the, uh, this is a, a successful nesting pair, and uh, when they when they do mate, there usually is uh, the eggs usually are fertilized, but for some reason they might not have been fertilized this year. Uh, another situation might be that uh, perhaps at some point the uh, the eggs were exposed to a cold, rainy day. Um, you know, one of the eggs might have been more tucked under, and the others got wet and exposed and and became chilled, uh, and that could have killed the developing embryos. Uh, 
A worst case scenario is what we were looking at way back in the 60s and 70s when pesticides and, uh, were causing trouble, particularly the, the uh, pesticide DDT. And uh, we found nest after nest where the eggs were either not hatching or would even break because of uh, the, imp the uh, impact of DDT on the egg laying process. It interfered with the uh, putting the calcium on the egg. And so eggs were laid too thin and then the females would incubate and then they'd break the eggs. Um, so let's hope this is not a uh, pesticide related uh, situation here and that the uh, either they weren't fertilized or <clears throat> they were naturally uh, exposed uh, and didn't hatch. Now she's, uh, you know, she looks, she's shading them now from the sun. She's beginning to pant a little bit too, so you can tell how hot it is outside. And according to my uh, temperature gauge here, it's 88 degrees outside right now, but there is a little breeze, so that is, that's good for them. We're looking at how he's tucked under there. He's going back to sleep, uh, the young, young osprey. And uh, they sleep about 99% of the time at this age. <clears throat> It's only during feeding and occasional movement that they will wake up. You notice she's always looking around too. She's constantly, uh, and I don't know if we have sound. Can we get sound on this? Is there a way to hear what's going on? Okay, well, maybe not. We might be able to. Kelsey, do you wanna to try to turn the sound on and see if it works? Yeah, we could talk about the sound too, what, what she's making. And... Sometimes playing a video via a Zoom lecture, the, the video and the sound um, don't work okay. well, but. Okay, well, if that's the case, fine. I have turned it on, so I'm not sure if you're able to hear it. Okay. Um, I'll have to tell her that you called because we are on our Zoom with one of our yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't hear it. Yeah, okay, I don't, yeah, I don't think it works. I remember we tried it before and. Okay, we well, what, we would have known that the male was present uh, or in the area uh, before he landed on the nest because they would have been communicating back and forth. Um, and uh, if you haven't heard an osprey and their normal uh, vocalization, they sound like big canaries, they chirp. Uh, and it's a very loud chirp that they often do when they're soaring overhead. And you, you know, I frequently will hear the chirp way before I see the birds or, and, or when I hear the chirp, then I look up and I scan the sky to see what's going on up there. But uh, I think, uh, you know, the vocalizations are to me a delight to hear. Uh, I, uh, I will put um, I will put the link to the live cam in the chat box, and uh, you can all watch that um, any time of day. And it does have sound, and it is pretty neat to hear. Uh, Bob, do you know um, two semi-related questions? When will the young start to fly? And also, when they're sort of this young, do they ever walk off the edge of the nest? Um, okay, let's do the walk off the nest first. Um, at this age, they're pretty much confined to the center of the nest where there's a very, you can see that the, the center of this nest is lined with uh, marsh grass. Um, often they use eelgrass, uh, which is the aquatic uh, grass that grows in shallow waters in Great Bay. Uh, this looks a little more like reeds and so on. Um, but that's basically where they, they stay. And you can see when they, re they get outside of that uh, center part of the nest, it's like an obstacle course. So that they get to that point and then they, they stop because it's hard for them to maneuver or to walk past that. Um, as they get older, they, they could go to the edge of the nest, but they're pretty good about not falling out. Um, the only way they might fall out is if they're trying to avoid a predator uh, that might be trying to get into the nest to attack them. Uh, now, ospreys do uh, defecate uh, by actually 
I use the term squirting because I think everybody can visualize that. They will back up their back end or their rear ends to the side of the nest and squirt it over the top and out uh, mm -hmm. so that most of the fecal material does not end up in the nest. Um, most birds of prey do it this way. Uh, however, the falcons are another uh, group, but they actually have their fecal material, they just drop straight down. Uh, so their nests do get soiled by uh, uh, the fecal material. Um, okay, so that's uh, that issue. Uh, the, uh, they will start to, when they get about six weeks old, um, they'll look a lot like the, they will have a lot of their feathers and they will, they will start standing up in the center of the nest and they will start flapping their wings and, and getting exercise. And the older they get, uh, they will increase that activity and they are, they're flapping and they jump up and down on the nest. And if you've got three ospreys on this nest, even though it's four feet across, uh, remember that the wingspan is about five feet. Um, you've got three young flapping and jumping around on the nest. You've got a lot of birds uh, bumping into each other and causing, causing trouble to one another. And they you typically will fledge, and when I use the term fledge, that is leave the nest um, at about seven and a half weeks to eight weeks. So uh, when they're you know 50 days old to 60 days old, uh, they will take their first flight. Uh, when that happens, it's it, it's almost hilarious to watch them fly because they they didn't know they could fly, and all of a sudden they're flying. And they'll fly around and if they're good, they'll circle around and fly back to the nest or they might uh, crash land in the marsh or they might float or fly to a, a tree nearby and uh, crash land on that. And, uh, but each flight they get better and they get stronger. And within a couple of weeks after fledging, they're, uh, they're uh, capable of good flight. Great. Do they uh, continue to build the nest all summer or do they kind of stop once the uh, babies reach a certain size? Yeah, they'll add some nesting material, particularly the, uh, uh, the softer material in the center of the nest. But most of the nest building takes place during the courtship um, time before eggs are laid. Now see, she's adjusting something out there. You know, that stick, um, for some reason is bothering her, so she's trying to move it. Uh, it's interesting that, well, most birds are this way. Their nests, uh, the actual way they're constructed and the size of them, at least the diameter across the top, is pretty consistent. Um, you know, a typical nest will be about like this one, about four feet across. Um, some might be five feet, but generally speaking, they're almost dead on four feet four and a half feet. Um, however, they do add new material every year. And if material isn't blown out over the winter, notice how she actually balls it. I'm sorry. She's, see how when she's walking around, she's very, very careful and even balls her foot uh, before she puts it down so that she doesn't step on the, the youngster with those. See how she's doing right now? She's just got her talons closed and uh, she doesn't want to step on the young with, with those sharp talons. So she's very gentle um, in her, and both the male is too, whenever he gets close to the young guy. So the young one gave a little stretch there and he continues to pant. And um, I feel like we're spying on them right now. <laughs> we're invading their privacy. Uh, for, forgive me if you already answered this question. I've been like taking notes and looking back and forth, but at what age will you band the chick? Uh, well, we can band them anywhere from the time their legs are uh, developed enough that the band, if we put the band on, it wouldn't fall off. So anywhere from about two weeks old uh, to the time they leave the nest. Um, it's better to ban them when they're about uh, maybe four weeks old or five weeks old before they 
they are able of anywhere near flying. Um, and, uh, but you don't want to ban them when a uh, situation might be dangerous for them. For example, if it's too hot out or if it's raining, you know, we wouldn't uh, ban the young then. We try to pick a cool day or a cool morning and we would ban the young at that point. But this little guy is not big enough yet to be banded. You can see the size of the band on the female's leg. It's, it's a good uh, half inch or more in diameter. And um, this little guy's leg right now is probably only a quarter inch or so in diameter. Um, so we wouldn't, you know, mom's doing a little um, self maintenance there by preening. Um, See, she's got a little feather loose, a, a kind of a down feather on her wing there. She'll probably preen that off at some point. And they're preening to straighten out the feathers uh, or to remove, uh, there might be some parasites uh, uh, there. You see, she, she uses her beak and she, um, if you've ever picked up a feather, you know you can split the web and then you could uh, um, kind of zip it back together with your fingers. Um, and um, believe it or not, that was uh, ospreys and birds came up with the first uh, uh, Velcro uh, closer system. <laughs> um, and we probably got the idea for Velcro from the uh, from birds feathers. Uh, so Bob, you talked about um, when they fledge, but where will the young go and when would they return to Great Bay? Okay. Um, okay, so let's look at the, the time period here. This guy hatched on June or on May 30th. Uh, he'll leave the nest probably around um, at seven, eight weeks. So some time toward the end of July, uh, maybe the 1st of August. Um, the parents will and once he leaves the nest uh, or flies, they will continue to feed him and take him uh, food and even, you know, have the young fly out with them as they're foraging and there is some learning going on and how to do it. And they will stay with the parents for about a month. Um, getting into the 1st of September, the females usually leave uh, the birds migrate independently, male, female, and the young. They, all, they don't stay together over the winter at all. So the female will leave uh, usually first. So she'll, she'll be gone by the first week, the 10 days in uh, September. The male will hang around a little bit, maybe bringing a fish occasionally into the young. But by the, the end of, or by the beginning of April, or I'm sorry, September, the uh, uh, the young will be um, fishing on their own and uh, the male will leave sometime between the, the you know, uh, the first half of September and then the young will go about the uh, mid-September. So they will migrate afterwards and they will never uh, necessarily it's ever see their parents again once they're, they're gone. They migrate to different places. Uh, um, the young uh, kind of wander southward. Uh, they'll wander all the way down into South America uh, to, it could end up even in Brazil, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela. Um, those are primary wintering areas. And they will wander there until they find a good place uh, with abundant fish. And if they find that place and they like it, they will stay the winter there and in fact, the young stay for a year and a half at that location and then migrate back here when they're almost two years old, um, arriving, uh, leaving South America um, probably in uh, late February, early March and arriving in Great Bay or vicinity uh, by uh, early April or early to mid April. Um, Traditionally, ospreys don't return to the, the, the young don't return to the nest where they hatched out, but they do return to within about 50 miles of where they hatched out. 
So this little guy, once he leaves, he could go spend the, you know, uh, two winters in uh, South America in let's say Colombia, and then come back and he could end up uh, 50 miles from Great Bay. So he could be up in Maine, he could be down in Massachusetts, um, um, you know, somewhere in that vicinity. Um, now the male and female, uh, they do mate for life. That is, they stay together for the most part um, until one of them disappears. And then they will accept another mate either on this nest or they will be attracted to another nest site uh, where they uh, will be attracted by another mate. Um, but it's amazing how both parents often get back to the nest almost on the same day. And that's what happened this year. Both parents arrived within a few hours of each other this year, which if you can imagine coming, you know, saying not having any communication whatsoever and spending uh, the winter in South America, leaving South America and arriving at the nest site on the same day, uh, it's pretty uh, amazing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, that was pretty great seeing them on the same day. Yeah. Um, it seems like sometimes the nest platform seems like it's a little bit shaky, either from the wind or if the birds are moving around a lot. Is there a need to make it more secure? And if so, what, what would we do? No, there's no need to make it more secure. Um, remember, this, this pair was nesting uh, in the nearby pine tree. Uh, and... Uh, you know, if you're out there when the wind's blowing 50 miles an hour, that pine tree is not stable. <laughs> it's moving back and forth and a lot more than this platform would be. So uh, I don't see any issue unless it, it, uh, there's risk of it um, breaking loose or falling over or something. There's no need to modify what we've done here. Can you tell us a little bit about what the biggest threats are to osprey survival in the U.S. and in um, other countries? Okay, um, in our country, well, let's talk about natural predators. Um, the osprey's number one enemy, unfortunately, is the bald eagle. <laughs> um, and bald eagles will attack the ospreys, uh, primarily they attack them. If an osprey has a fish, let's say an osprey just caught a fish and there's a bald eagle nearby, you can bet that that bald eagle was gonna chase that osprey and till the osprey drops the fish. And then it will recover the fish and leave the osprey alone until the osprey catches another fish. Um, and during that combat, more or less in the air, the eagle could uh, actually catch the osprey and kill it. So uh, that, you know, there've been documented cases where that's happened. But usually the osprey escapes by dropping the fish and the eagle doesn't pursue anymore. Um, the, uh, so that's the, the uh, kind of bird predators. Um, the, uh, the threats to them, um, because they're fishing in the water, uh, and when they dive, they dive head first with feet in front of their head. So they thrust their feet forward. So they're, as they dive down, just before they hit the water, they thrust their feet forward to catch the fish. Um, and often because of carelessness or whatever, uh, people will have thrown fishing line, you know, that they've gotten tangled up uh, or sometimes lures have broken off or whatever, or fish have broken the, fi uh, the lines of fishermen and they have fish, uh, you know, hooks in the fish and the osprey catches the fish. And they will sometimes get tangled up in that. And I've, we've seen a situation several times where the, the adults will bring those back to the nest and the young get tangled up in them and they will, they could die in that situation. Uh, so that's another issue. Um, uh, their, their nests are out exposed 
and the tops of trees, the highest points usually where they are. And occasionally the nest will be hit by lightning. Uh, that's another potential threat to them, um, a natural threat. <clears throat> Uh, because they are a top predator and um, there's a, a biomagnification of things like lead and pesticides. I just, oh, I just out my window right now, a bald eagle just dipped down on the water and caught a fish. <laughs> I'm looking out on the Oyster River and he's flying off to, uh, to land up on the tree on, across from my house here. Sorry about that distraction, but <laughs> uh, we've got live action going on here. <laughs> um, so where were we? We were talking about uh, threats. So, you know, they are, they can be poisoned, um, but generally speaking, there are not many uh, natural threats in the US. Uh, we, people don't shoot ospreys like they might have 50 or 100 years ago. Uh, however, when they go to South America, that's a different issue because you've got people from all level income levels from subsistence uh, uh, farmers to subsistence fishermen uh, that uh, if they could shoot a bird like this, they would eat it. Um, and so they are subject to that kind of mortality in, in places outside the US. Um, and at one point, uh, biologists were putting uh, bright colored, um, we call them colored leg bands on the ospreys. And although I don't have any documentation of this, uh, the, uh, I could just imagine that one of the hunters down in the Brazilian Amazon uh, shot an osprey and, and found these brightly colored uh, rings on the legs. And he said, wow, if this bird has those rings, I wanna collect those for a necklace or something. And they might be killed for that purpose. Uh, but generally speaking, the ospreys are, populations are very healthy right now. Uh, they're, in, they're still increasing in numbers from the low in the 70s when they were the population in New England, all of New England was about a hundred pair of ospreys. Uh, and now we've got thousands of pairs of ospreys in New England. So they're, uh, they're a wonderfully adaptive bird um, and that they, they do tolerate humans. Uh, they nest uh, close to humans, sometimes even on chimneys. Uh, and um, you can approach the nests fairly closely without disturbing them too much. You can walk on the boardwalk at the Great Bay Discovery Center out on the marsh there and you can view the ospreys. Uh, and that far away, there's absolutely no disturbance whatsoever. They would, they would just get used to the people walking that far away. So they're, they're great. So she's continuing to preen. The little guy is kind of in the, in the shade. And again, look at how gently she walks around the nest. She's very, very gentle. Okay, I'm Do sorry I exhausted that last question. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Um, at what age will we know if the baby is male or female? Um, you know, I've never, the only way we could really tell is when the, it's just about full grown. Um, and we could look at the size of the tarsus um, the females, when I say the tarsus, that's the bare part of the leg where the band is. Um, the females will be more massive. Uh, their feet will be larger. Um, and we could begin to sex them then, but then there's still overlap in ospreys. Some males are larger than other males and some females are smaller than other females. And there could be overlap in size. And the feather patterns, you know, you see the, the female's wings here, they're basically brown. The exposed part of it's basically a dark brown. When, if this was a young bird, all the tips of their feathers would be white. And so they're very distinctively different uh, than the adults. Um, and their breast has a taunt, the young breast uh, feathers have tawny patches on them and so do the, uh, the, the crests on the back. So you can't really see whether they're they're spotted or not. Uh, I would never 
say with 100% certainty, a young bird was a male or a female um, just by looking at it. Um, so you learn that when they become adults. Great, thank you. Oh, did you see that? <laughs> see, how, see how she squirted that out the back there? <laughs> a little, uh, and none of that went in the nest. It was all directed outside the nest. And if you go, if you walk around out on the ground outside the nest, you will see a ring of what we call whitewash, <laughs> where the, the uh, birds have squirted the fecal material outside the nest, so to keep uh, for good nest sanitation. Sometimes it lands on the camera and then we have yeah. to wait until the next rain to well, get a good view. That probably, they, they know we're watching them. <laughs> um, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. Yeah, and again, if anybody has questions, you can always uh, contact the Discovery Center and they can forward emails to me and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. And now she's going to brood it. She, well, I think she uh, looked like she was going to cover it with her whole body there, but she's still not. She said that my husband came in, I'm being anthropomorphic, came in and he adjusted all these sticks. Now I got to put them back the way they were. <laughs> okay, she's very gingerly going over to brood the young right now. Well, maybe not. It looked like she was. She's still adjusting nesting material. Now remember that bird is about um, 24 inches from the tip of the bill to the tip of the tail and with a five foot wingspan. I think the male had a 60 inch wingspan and the female had a 62 inch wingspan when we, when we banded them, we measured that, uh, that size. We did just have one more, more question comment that I, I kind of actually forgot about, but a few weeks ago, there was a, a maybe it was a few weeks ago, there was a third osprey that okay. landed on yep. the nest. So I don't know if maybe you wanted to chat about that for sure. a second. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't think there are any children in the audience, but maybe if there are, I apologize, but uh, teenagers can be very bothersome. <laughs> and, uh, that it was very likely a, uh, a young adult uh, that come, just had returned for the first time from South America. And uh, who knows what they were doing uh, on the nest. Um, if it had been a older bird, uh, potential threat to either the male or female for, from, a mate, from a mate point of view, they the whatever sex that young would have been chased away by the same sex on the nest. Um, but uh, since it probably came in and, and, and through its behavior acted like a youngster, uh, they tolerated it for a short time. Do you remember, do you know how long it stayed? Anybody know? Did it stay for a couple of minutes uh, or is it just in and out or? You know, I'm not sure. Um, I didn't see it happen live. Someone sent us some pictures. Yeah. Um, I think I think he might be on this chat. I don't know, um, Michael, if you can hear me. I don't know if that was you that witnessed it live. If you want to unmute yourself, if you know how long it lasted. Yeah, that was me. Um, I was just looking back. I've actually been sort of keeping a Word document with screenshots and stuff. So just for fun. But uh, <clears throat> if I find it, I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah, I suspect that it was a short of short duration. Yeah, it was it was no it was no more than a couple of minutes. Yeah. And I, I would be willing to bet it was a young bird that just uh, was being annoying. And because of its behavior, the parents allowed it to arrive. If it had been a a, a nesting adult, uh, an older adult, uh, there would have been some fighting going on. There would have been a territorial dispute there. Uh, and um, I have found dead ospreys on the nest, um, dead adults. Um, 
And I don't know whether they died of natural causes or they died because of that kind of interaction where a third party got involved and um, just wanted to take over. Um, that happens, but uh, it's rare. Bob, I'm not sure if, uh, if we know this, but do you know what percentage of the young make it back from South America or wherever they migrate to for the winter? Yeah. Um, you know, that's a hard question to, to answer um, because the way we track ospreys, we track them either by banding them um, or by using satellite transmitters on them um, so that we could track them daily or hourly throughout the year. Um, the banding records are are much more difficult to deal with because you might band every member of the population, but there's always immigration into the uh, population um, from outside where they might have been banded. So you'd have to actually catch the catch the birds when they return and read the bands, or if they're on a webcam like this, sometimes you can read the band numbers and identify the birds. Um, but in nature, basically all the ospreys and most species uh, do is that they replace themselves, they, they replace the, the adults. So these birds start nesting at three years and they might nest for 10 or 15 years successfully and then they might perish with some mortality along the way. Um, so during that whole entire nesting time, all they need to do is replace the male and female with another male and female. So nest mor or mortality is high uh, among the younger birds. Uh, probably, you know, during the first migration, 50% of them disappear. And then, uh, and I'm just guesstimating here, I should probably have the, the there probably have been studies that report this, but I would say probably just a, a couple, let's say 20% of them make it back um, uh, from South America. The first migration is deadly. Um, there was a bird that left uh, Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts and flew a thousand miles over the ocean. They can't, they can't land on the water. So it was a nonstop flight down to the Bahamas. Um, and fortunately it made it and survived. We know that through satellite telemetry studies, but uh, that is a long way for a young osprey that's been only flying for maybe six weeks to take that flight without ending up uh, dead. So, um, you know, that first year is deadly and they're searching all over South America for that right wintering spot where there's good food and, um, not to, they're not disturbed too much. Um, and so in that process of searching for that good place to winter, um, there's high mortality as well. So I'd say 20% make it back, maybe. Wow. Um, the next question is sort of a two-part question. The first part, uh, Beth kind of already answered, but what kind of fish do the osprey eat? And so this season, um, Beth, our assistant education coordinator is tracking um, what we see on the camera. And she has seen them bring, she's seen the male bring white perch, river herring and flounder this season. Um, but the second part of the question, Bob, maybe you can answer, do they ever eat anything other than fish? Yes. Um, you know, I was thinking about that today. Uh, ospreys, like any, really any bird of prey, they're opportunistic feeders. Um, any fish, you know, they, they've brought in those three species because those are the ones that they encounter most that they see. And uh, just so you realize it, basically a fish below 20 inches of water is out of reach for the osprey. They can't dive down. They don't dive underwater. They, they hit the surface and the momentum carries them down. But a fish below 18, 20 inches is really not accessible to them. But any, any uh, fish or object uh, 
swimming on the surface, uh, the ospreys uh, could potentially catch them. So they could catch a water snake, for example. Um, I have seen one flying with a, a blue crab. Um, I have a picture of one flying with a blue crab. Um, a few years ago, uh, I don't know if the, everybody remembers this, but I think it was uh, 2018, we had gray squirrel Armageddon going on <laughs> in, uh, around here where the gray squirrel population had reached a, an unbelievable size that the, they were moving um, and they were beginning, they would be dozens killed on the road and I had never seen a gray squirrel swim across, swim at all, ever. But we regularly had gray squirrels swimming across the Oyster River behind my house. And uh, I see no reason why an osprey wouldn't go down and catch that gray squirrel uh, as it's flying across the river. Um, it's not a normal prey, uh, but it is in the medium that they, where they hunt. So, um, don't have any documentation that they caught any gray squirrels, but if they're out there, they'll likely catch them, so. Great, and just um, one more question, um, which I think you may have already answered, but just in case, how large is the adult osprey's wingspan? Okay, the, the wingspan is about five feet. Um, our two, the male and female here, were just a couple inches different in their wingspan I think one was 60 inches and one was 62 inches. So five feet, five foot two. Um, they're a large bird and um, they're, uh, uh, you know, there might be, yeah, that's probably about average size for them. And they're about uh, 24 inches long from the tip of the bill to the tip of the tail. And notice you, just, you can clearly see the female's eyes there are yellow. Uh, if that was a young bird, uh, when we, we were able to watch this young guy later on, his eyes will be orange or burnt orange. Um, and that's just another uh, identification of a young osprey. Great, thank you. Uh, we had a lot of great questions and as always, Bob did awesome answering them. Kelly, I'm not sure if you have anything you wanted to say to kind of wrap it up. <clears throat> no, I just really wanted to, to thank you again, Bob, for sharing your expertise. And it was um, a very um, uh, action-packed hour uh, yep. this time around. So we got lucky. So thank you all for joining us and keep watching. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.